For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Seven oh six. Welcome to today's Entrepreneur, presented by Fuller Landau, a program about the entrepreneurial spirit that drives Quebec business. My name is Dan Delmar, along with Fuller Landau's Josh Miller. Good evening, Josh. Hello, Dan. And at tonight on the program, we'll talk to David Swade of uh, Evolocity Financial Group, and we'll talk to Ernie Ford as well uh, about some tax issues later in the program. It should always be fun. Uh, but first, some entrepreneurial news, and uh, let's start here in Montreal because we, we talked about this a lot in, over the past few weeks, and this this study that that put Montreal in one hundred and twenty one, one hundred and twenty. Yeah. Out of about 121. Yeah, got to be proud. It's uh, it would be quite a climb to get to get to the top 10 uh, as far as uh, businesses uh, in Canada or cities in Canada rather that are conducive to, uh, to owning and operating and starting a business. We're going to start with the top 100. We'll go from there. Yes, that's that's maybe something to shoot for. So um, we we got to look at sort of uh, the system now, and we have these uh, these C decks, these Centre de Développement Économique, and we've we've had 18 of them. I didn't know there that there was that many, but there's 18 mm-hmm, of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're going to be narrowed down to six, um, but Montreal is going to start implementing some uh, some programs to to help small business. What they were what they'll do exactly? Uh, the program is called PM or MTL. Uh, so they'll they'll concentrate these service areas into six hubs uh, that will support entrepreneurs with services uh, uh, for funding business and uh, and advice as well for entrepreneurs. Um, what can these organizations do? Uh, I think would be my question for you, Josh. You know, what, what should they be doing? Because obviously, the eighteen of them that exist right now have been haven't been doing enough. Well, you know, Dan, uh, what obviously they could do is find a way to put money in the pockets of these entrepreneurs. Now, there's so many businesses in Quebec. I mean, Quebec is built on the back of entrepreneurs, the back of small businesses. So it's not as if they can devote. Ten, twenty-five, fifty thousand dollars per business. It's not going to happen. So it'll probably be a lot of small things. You know, the thousand, the two thousand, the five thousand. Whether it's grants, whether it's subsidies. Um, but the question is, what will they do and help bring traffic to their business, to their stores or their businesses? What will they do to help? You know, kind of increase the top line. It's not so much. What can they do to reduce or minimize the, the 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 expenses so that their bottom line gets hit? But how how can they drive business? And that's that's still kind of unknown. You know, they're they're there. They they know the city very well. Where we live in this lovely infrastructure uh, of of getting around town, and and you hear we you know we constantly hear and talk about retailers saying how in the world is the customer getting to me because they can't make it. People in Laval, people in the South Shore, they don't want to come into town. So I, I truly hope that these these new six hubs uh, can find ways to bring and attract people and business to the businesses on the island. I'm actually not sure how they're going to do it. And from a dollar standpoint, I'm sure it's going to be very small scale. But something is better than nothing. And going from 121st to 99th, hopefully at least that. You know, formerly I was a a reporter for this covering the city of Montreal, and I saw a lot of these how these organizations worked. And I saw you know they'd give grants here and there and do mm-hmm. sp- talks and here and there, but the grants usually would be pretty small. You know, uh, sometimes a thousand bucks, five thousand bucks. When you're giving away uh, grants that small, can it really have an econ- economic impact, or are you just giving away money? No. No economic impact. You're just giving away money. I mean, does a thousand bucks really go towards somebody who's who's starting off on their own and they have they they're working out of their basement? Can a thousand bucks do something? Yeah, it can help. You know, feed them for lunch for a few weeks. But the reality is, what's a thousand bucks going to do? Somebody is thinking on a bigger scale and they're thinking longer term. It's not going to do a darn thing. Hmm. All right, so uh, we'll have to wait and see, I suppose. Uh, meanwhile, there is some some good news provincially. The premier has been going on various economic missions. Uh, the mayor is actually in uh, in China right now, I believe. The premier mm-hmm. signed a deal with Vermont, um, and uh, our trade with Vermont has risen forty percent since since twenty ten. Apparently, um, pretty important, I think, to 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 have good partnerships, especially with uh, with states that are that are very close to us, like Vermont. Well, and, and I think that entrepreneurs, you know, they they can't. It's great to have uh, public partnerships, if you will, public-private partnerships. And I think that can certainly facilitate business. It can open doors. But at the end of the day, and, and I was going to say this just you know, on, on, on the heels of your last comment, Dan, is you got to go out and make your own success and drive your own factors and get out there and, and even invest your own dollars and time because that's what's going to make it. Yes, can some of these 
agreements. Uh, I won't call them free trade agreements, but I'll call them uh, business facilitator agreements. Can some of those absolutely help? Yes. Garbage in, garbage out. If you if you don't put in the effort and go and chase it and make sure that the person on the other end of that agreement, it, it's beneficial for them, well then, it doesn't matter what agreements are out there between Quebec, Vermont, or Canada and the States, it's not going to happen. There has to be something that is financially viable for both sides. Hmm. Uh, we were, we've often discussed retail and how retail needs to sort of take it to the next level, um, especially with uh, with competition from online. And uh, a new food store at the Café des Trente is, is doing that. Pretty interesting uh, a place here. It's called uh, Chez Lionel. And uh, basically, they have they, they take it a bit further in terms of the quality, but they also have uh, concierges uh, to help you choose your food, and they have even nutritionists on site to help you uh, to help you choose your food. Is this an example? This is probably an example, I guess, of of um, of retailers really going the extra mile to keep people into the in the stores. You know, I I think they were terming a grocery store 2.0, and, and I don't know if it's appealing to the the lazy part of the community. I don't know if it's appealing to the people that really just want you know, want the higher level, the higher quality, but have somebody else do it. Uh, but I think from the grocery store standpoint, they're just trying to be a little bit different. There's clearly, there, there's so much competition in the regular grocery store chain to be a little bit different, to stand out is not easy. And to do, and to, to stand out in this market is something that's going to drive people into the store. We always talk about, Dan, of giving the consumer, giving the customer a reason why to walk into a store. Well, if you're going to be this different, well, then you're giving that reason for the for the customer to walk into the store and can only be good for business. On the entrepreneurial side, I think they're also looking at, you know, having other brands, other makes, uh, other factors into their store. It's kind of reducing the risk level. You know, the butcher that's in there is maybe a separate name, a separate butcher. The, 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 other, the other components that make up a grocery store, they're bringing in outside external businesses into their own store, into their own premises. And I think... Not only does it bring a, a very much of a difference and very much of a, a differentiation from a grocery store, it also kind of reduces the risk a little bit from the owner because they're allowing some of those other, that other inventory, those other products to be kind of carved out amongst a few people. Speaking of interesting retail experiences, uh, Canuck or Canuck, the Quebec brand uh, from the 70s, big into winter wear, um, they're also coming out with a pretty interesting retail experiment. So they're, they're going to have a flagship store on Rachel Street, 12,000 square feet. Um, they're really taking things to the next level. They're going to have an indoor cold room, a fridge, basically, where people can walk in and actually test out the coats. Um, again, uh, the uh, someone from Canuck calls it uh, shoppertainment. Uh, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, and, and again, adding that experience. It, it, well, that's what it is. It's another different customer experience that they won't get elsewhere. People will walk into it. Listen, I remember, uh, you know, you know, I travel to Hong Kong frequently, and in Hong Kong, in one of the in one of the kind of restaurant bar districts, they have their Russian vodka bar, and you can go in and have shots of vodka inside a freezer. That's different. People were drawn into something that was just extremely different. This is different. This is you can test your you can test your product inside cold temperatures in the middle of summer. That doesn't happen everywhere, uh, but certainly here it does. Yeah, and I could just jump in, guys. Oh, yeah. sure. Go, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. David uh, David Swade of Avala City Financial Group. We'll get to your, to your profile in just a couple of minutes, but yeah, yeah. go ahead. So uh, I'm very involved in, on the payment processing side with retailers, and um, All Saints has an interesting concept. They're coming to Canada, a fairly large chain uh, across the world. They're going to have a much smaller store in Pacific Mall in Vancouver. Uh, the rents are high, and their concept is we're going to have one size of one style um, in the entire store. So you won't see small, medium, large, extra large. You can see one style, and with your smartphone, you're going to select you're going to scan the QR code. Mm -hmm. You're going to select the styles that you like. Someone's going to bring out the the, the items for you, and you're you're going to be able to try it on and say, I like, I don't like it at the end, check out that way and it makes the process seamless. You walk out the door, you charge your card and away you go. And the concept for them is, is that, you know, they want something different. They can't, you know, they want to keep a, a, a normal retail footprint, uh, but be innovative a little bit. So, you know, those are the kinds of things I see. I think you're seeing a lot of in, in retail. Everyone wants that Apple experience. Mm. So clearly, yeah, going the extra mile to, uh, to to make people go to the store instead of going online. Uh, today's Entrepreneur, we're more with uh, David Swade of uh, Velocity Financial Group in just a second. But first, it's 7.15. <laughs> 
For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. 720, welcome back to today's Entrepreneur, inspiring stories from outstanding business people. Dan Delmar and Fuller Landau's Josh Miller with you. And this evening, our guest is David Suede of Evelocity Financial Group. Uh, welcome back to CJD, David. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me. No worries. So uh, let's start uh, with the easiest question. What is Evelocity and, uh, and what do you do? Sure. Uh, so thanks for having me, guys. Um, Evelocity Financial Group is a small business uh, online lending platform. Uh, we finance small and medium-sized businesses, uh, anywhere from 10000 to $200,000. Um, it's effectively who we are. Online. So what you're saying is you don't see the customer ever. Uh, rarely we do. No, rarely we don't. We don't. Um, merchant will go online, apply for for a loan, or will you know come through our, our call center channels, uh, and then we'll work with them that way. But uh, generally speaking, it's online or over the phone. And typically, are they all Quebec, Canadian, Montreal? Like where where do they come from? Or is it really international? No, right now we're Canada, across Canada, primarily Quebec and Ontario, but spread out across the country. Is that something you start like? So, how did this idea start to begin with? Sure. Where did this e velocity, you know? And I keep thinking travelocity, so it's it certainly can be big and growing. Where did e velocity come from? Where where is the origin? Sure, it's interesting you talk about tra travelocity. When we rebranded, we originally called Mercantile, uh, which was a very old ish name. And uh, when we rebranded, the idea was evolution of lending, speed of decisioning, e velocity. So that's kind of how we got to the name. The key in this business is um, speed and sort of reinventing the way uh, business loans are, are done today as opposed to the way it was done you know, 20 years ago. Um, so how, how it really started was back in 2008, I guess it was, during uh, the U.S. sort of credit crisis, um, I was exposed to this this concept of of of, of um, being able to apply for a loan online. Companies like Lending Club, uh, and you could see, you know, there were some diff some challenges they were solving. Number one, the banks were starting to restrict access uh, to working capital, especially for smaller merchants, merchants who were looking for smaller amounts, merchants in certain industries, uh, and it was time-consuming and cumbersome. You'd send in paperwork, you have to go meet with the banker, it would take three to you know three weeks sometimes to do it, and you needed financial statements. A lot of these merchants didn't have it. And what these companies did was they really reinvented the notion of how to apply for, for, for business loans. And I thought the concept was really, really brilliant. So brought it back here to Canada. At the time, I had just bought um, a company called Sterling Payments. Uh, we started Sterling Payments, and we bought uh, a portfolio of merchants uh, from Optimal Payments. It was about you know several thousand merchants, mm -hmm. and we, you know my partner Harley and I thought this is the perfect add-on product to these merchants. Um, they're looking for for working capital. It's difficult for them to get. Uh, the banks are restricting access. So let's let's develop a platform. So we spent a couple of years basically developing our technology platform to make this process fast and seamless. We started, you know, basically selling it into the Sterling base of customers, testing it out. Um, we got really good, strong adoption. And then in 2010, uh, we got it to a point where it was ready to, to grow. And, and since 2010, we've really uh, grown significantly. And, and there's no doubt, I mean, there's so much that happens behind the scenes and there's certain, you know, different level of risk when you're taking on these things. And when we come back from the break, yeah. we'll explore a couple of those things and much more. David, Perfect. Wade of Velocity Financial Group joins us this evening on Today's Entrepreneur at 723. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. 726 on Today's Entrepreneur. Our guest this evening is David Swade of Velocity Financial Group. Uh, so David, you know, uh, microfinancing is becoming uh, popular in, in various countries around the world. Is this sort of like sort of the uh, the, the first world version of, of microfinancing? Or is it still considered microfinancing? It, it is. It is, yeah. definitely considered okay. microfinancing for sure. And it's definitely getting more and more popular. Um, you know, as it's getting more widespread adoption, I think we're seeing a lot more uh, merchants understanding what it is and what it's all about and how it works. Is that, yeah. a, is that a good sign that, 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 that microfinancing is, is starting to become more popular? Does it mean that perhaps there are more entrepreneurs out there? I think it is. I think we very much try to support the entrepreneurs in their growth. We view this as growth capital. Um, this is an opportunity for a lot of our merchants to take you know, this working capital and expand their locations, uh, buy you know, additional inventory, do things to grow their business. And, and I think it is, it is good. And you see a lot of, a lot of players in the space. Now, in, in many businesses, everybody has to manage different levels of risk. Sure. How do you guys manage risk? I mean, you're lending anywhere from ten to $200,000 yeah. to people that you're not even interview. I mean, you're collecting a lot of data, but how do you manage your risk? I think that's the key. We really do collect a lot of data. Uh, we've got a really good risk management team led by Harley. 
And we've developed a, developed a really good risk scoring system to determine merchants who we think uh, were most likely to repay. And uh, I think a lot of this comes down to the data we gather. So we look at a merchant's 24 months processing history, their past 24 months. Uh, we'll look at a merchant's bank statements. We'll look at uh, Yelp reviews, the Yelp ratings, if they're a restaurant or a retailer. We'll gather you know, almost 100 data points that we pull into our risk scoring decision to predict a merchant's, um, what we think is a good a good merchant. You know, the old model was very much your personal credit score, looking at financial statements, but a lot of these smaller merchants, they don't have financial statements and, and the health of their business is far be better for the most part than maybe their individual uh, personal credit score is. So I think we've evolved and I don't know that the banking industry necessarily has evolved as much. So you don't look very much at personal credit score? We do, but to a much smaller degree than all the other data. Because the personal credit score is, you know, if you didn't pay your Rogers bill on time, it, it affects your personal credit score. Uh, but whereas if we look at your overall health of your business and you've got a really strong growing business, good Yelp ratings, good Urban Spoon ratings, uh, strong bank statements, strong cash flow, um, you know, why, why should we judge you harshly because you had a, a personal credit score this week? We really try to look at a large amount of data uh, as opposed to sort of single points. Now, you started this in 2008. You really ramped up in 2010. Technology and information available online yeah. has certainly changed over the years. Massive. So we're, is it much easier for you to gather data today? And what were you doing at the beginning when you maybe didn't have access to all that? Well, at the beginning, you're looking at um, comparables of processors' data. So Moneris, as an example, put out a spend report that will show you, you know, a merchant in Saskatchewan that's in the restaurant industry and what the chart their chart is and compare it to their peers in that same space. So you're doing a lot of that manually. Now you can pull that in much more electronically. Stats can gives you a lot of data, lets you compare your merchants that, that are applying uh, to their peers. And if a merchant's chart looks good, it's it's a positive indicator for them. So we're using a ton of data. We're very much a data driven company. We're using a ton of data to make good good uh, risk decisions. Now, is it is it something that you've developed? Like it's a software that gathers data automatically as soon as you you plug in a certain number of things. I mean, there's no doubt that people are of course applying online. So you have a, a form that's you know pages long. Uh, you know, is it something that you developed and refined over time? So the, the 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 online process is actually six pages, six steps. Merchants can fill it in literally within ten minutes. Um, but there's still a human interaction. I mean, even a lot of merchants who do apply, you know, we'll ask for some follow up information. We'll try to get some clarification. So there's, I don't want to leave the impression that it's a hundred percent online. Mm -hmm. There's still a bit of an interaction. Um, but we do gather that data, and then we then go out and get additional data to make our decision. Um, you know, m more more effectively uh, from other sources. And I think that's the key, making it easy for these merchants. A lot of times we ask them to give us documents. If we can gather as much of that information um, on their behalf, it makes it easy for them. These are busy people. They're, you know, they're really busy and they, they need this to be fast. They need to be seamless uh, and they need you to do as much of the work as possible. And that's what we try to do. David Swaid of Velocity Financial Group this evening on Today's Entrepreneur at 7.30. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. 7.35, welcome back to Today's Entrepreneur, presented by Fuller Landau, a program about the entrepreneurial spirit that drives Quebec business. My name is Dan Delmar, along with Fuller Landau's Josh Miller, and our guest this evening is David Swade of Velocity Financial Group. And uh, let's head into uh, to marketing now. Um, it's interesting because, Josh, it's uh, sometimes perhaps this is a very specific kind of business. Uh, David, how, how do you market uh, money, basically? How do you market financial services? Everybody wants to borrow, so it's yeah. easy, you know. <laughs> we have money to give. Come find us. Sold. Yeah. It's actually, you know, you've got to work to find the right types of partners and the right types of merchants. We, we typically go to market three ways. Uh, one is we have a direct sales team. Two, we've got digital marketing channel, and th which, which is which is big when you're in the online space. And thirdly, uh, we have a partnership channel. So we just announced a deal with a company called Global Payments. Global's the second largest uh, credit card processor mm -hmm. uh, in Canada, and they want to be able to sell this product, these our products, into their client base as a value add. Um, you know, in the credit card processing world, these types of products are valuable. It's the same type of market uh, for both lending and, and payments, uh, and that's been a huge partnership for us. You know, in terms of credit validation of, of our products, and and you know, they have about a hundred thousand small and medium sized businesses uh, that they want to market this into. So, uh, the, those are the three ways we typically go to market. Do you do you measure which one is more effective than the other? Do you realize that all three bring their own value? All three bring value. Um, we certainly measure each channel and its and its effectiveness for sure. 
Yeah. Now, what about, because it's still fairly new. I mean, I don't know how many people are comfortable or, or know that they can kind of apply online for, for, for financing. You know, they, you have your online companies, you have this, you know, this orange colored company we won't mention, you know, the, yeah, that, that can go sure. on. But is part of it actually educating the consumer? De- definitely part of it's educating it. And, you know, companies like PayPal are offering PayPal working capital, they're square capital. So a lot of the companies in the payments world are now offering these types of microfinancing products. And I think by doing that, it's adding to sort of the the education process, but we too have to educate, you know, what does it mean? How does it work? Um, you know, the repayment options that you have, we have fixed product, we have a variable repayment product that works well for, you know, seasonal merchants in Niagara, um, you know, depends on your needs, depends on the area you're in. So uh, there's a lot of education ab- about this, but I would tell you when we first started this in 2010, the education was a lot harder. In 2015, it's a lot easier. There's a lot more merchants who are very aware of this type of product and really like it and, and, and use it. And, and I would tell you that banks are all also becoming much more aware of this. This is a, a world that they haven't played in for a long time, and they're seeing a lot of competitors, you know, um, lending clubs, on decks, um, getting into this space. And, and this is an area that they're they're watching for sure. Do you, do you monitor your competition? And is there a lot of competition in Canada, or is there maybe more competition south of the border? There's a lot more competition south of the border. It started in the U.S. It was there a lot earlier. It's a much bigger market. A lot of the American um, competitors. They look at Canada as you know, 30 million people. It's the size of California. Different languages, different regulatory environment. It's 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 maybe not worth their effort. So it's a lot. You know, there's less competition in Canada, but it's definitely uh, grown more as as these payment companies have decided to to launch this, these types of products. Now it's still fairly new, and that means that. It takes a good team to make sure that they're educating the consumer and that they know the product. Yeah. So uh, how many people are you today at eVelocity? Uh, we're 28. So you didn't start at 28. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you've had, um, it sounds like you've had a good growth run. So maybe you can kind of talk us through how you, you know, building the right team around you for this this product or service that's essentially new. Yeah, I think I think you, you said it well. It's it's building the right team around you. The key to I think being entrepreneurial is finding the right people, really good people. Um, we've got some really good people on the team, but didn't start that way. So we went from you know three people to seven to twelve to and you build it over time with the you know finding the right people. But it's key uh, to finding the right people and the people who fit the right culture. So. Each interview we would do, you know, we really focused in on do these people can they fit our culture, and we're trying to build a culture, uh, and that takes time. And uh, so, for, so forget the skill set, forget their knowledge. You well, you, you hired both. for you hired for character and attitude first. I think I think what you f- try to find is someone who have this skill set, but who also culturally fit the organization you're trying to build, and that's been so important. I think in a small company, if you bring the wrong type of person in, they can have a much bigger impact than if you're IBM and you've got a hundred thousand people. Have you had to deal with hiring the wrong person, or did you? correct that decision early we did we did i mean it takes longer you know we'd like to move quicker and we maybe didn't in some instances but we learned each time you know we may have made some mistakes we learned for the next time and i think that's the key is you're not always going to get it right but make sure that you've learned from that and and uh, and fix it moving forward and then i think we've done a really good job in bringing in really really uh, good people um, but it's hard initially you know when you're small and you're trying to recruit people um it's hard to convince them that this growth plans they, they got to buy into you they have to buy into your vision uh, there's a lot of leap of faith you know we would We'd meet people from, I don't want to seem like I'm picking on the banks, but, you know, we'd meet people from the banks and you could tell they were very structured. You know, I remember mm-hmm. one, one employee said, you know, can I see your financial statements? It was the first interview and I sort of, you know, I, they were sort of underwriting us and, and it was a bit, you know, it was fun, kind of fun. Did you hire them? No. <laughs> nor, nor do we hire the people who say, you know, what's your what's your policy on this or that? that? You know, it, it's sometimes you just, you know, culture is important. We want people who are going to come in and be part of a young, dynamic team. And, um, you know, that's really what we look for. You know, they have to buy in a little bit. There's a bit of a leap of faith early on. It's a little bit easier now that we're, we're a much, you know, bigger size. And, and you're also, you're, you're not alone. You have, you have one or two partners. Yeah. So you must feed off each other. You must collaborate. You must, you know, strengths and weaknesses that you balance. Uh, sure. how, how many partners do you have? And, and how do you work together and how do you kind of share your responsibilities? For sure. Yeah, we're, we're three primary operating partners. I handle sales, marketing, product. Uh, Harley Greenspoon handles um, risk, operations, finance. It's, you know, he's a lawyer by trade background. Actually, both he and Neil are both lawyers by trade. Uh, Neil Wexler is, is the third partner. He's primarily responsible for sort of strategy, partnerships, uh, capital raising. You know, it's a capital intensive business and, and Neil's primary responsibilities out there are making sure we, we raise uh, the necessary capital and 
sort of the three of us, uh, I think we think a lot alike, but we also think very differently and we challenge each other. We've got different experiences. And I think you make better decisions when people sort of debate it out and then ultimately come out with a decision, but you really think through all the options. You know, sometimes I think maybe we think it through too much, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, generally speaking, it's a, it, the better decisions usually come out of that. Has it been tough to raise capital in the last five, six years? Uh, it was a lot tougher five years ago. It's a, a little bit easier now. Uh, it's still difficult, but um, you know, I, I think I think the credibility, the industries uh, evolved to a point, especially when you look at what's going on in the U.S., that people are getting a lot more uh, understanding of the market and the opportunity, and and wanting to dip their toes in. Because you're you're when you were talking about your your previous business or other business, Sterling, it's cash management, it's cash in, it's cash out. Yep. Um, so you're not really borrowing too much, but this business is extremely different. So was there a bit of a learning curve from a cash management or did you really just make sure that you were well capitalized before you even began? Yeah, I mean, we tried to make sure you're well capitalized, but as you're growing and we're going really rapidly, you're trying to stay ahead of the curve is, is, is difficult, but uh, Neil does a great job and um, I think we're in good shape and, uh, you know, but, but they are different businesses. The nice part about it is that the two businesses had a lot of synergies between the two. So we actually shared quite a few of the resources. So we share, you know, sometimes, you know, customer service or risk at times over time. So that helped uh, two smaller companies together. And then, you know, over time, Evelocity uh, grew to a size where it's, it's much more standalone now, but you know, all those things really helped. Now it, so you're a few partners. Yep. Um, what happens if you disagree? I know you worry, really talk things out or whatever, but seriously, if you guys don't all see on the same page, what happens? Yeah. Ultimately, you know, we haven't had this scenario. Ultimately, it's sort of, you know, the three of us make sure we come to a consensus decision. If one of us, you know, disagrees and the other two agree, then then that sort of sort of majority rule. But it really hasn't gotten to that. I think we really make the you know, ultimately get to a point where we, we feel comfortable with the decision. Even if we don't agree with all aspects, we, we agree and we move forward. Now, part of the business is, uh, you know, because you, you said you, you, you lend money between ten and $200,000, so you had to make a conscious decision, the min and the max. Yep. There's also pricing issues. How do, you, how do you price yourselves in the market? Do you look at your competition? Do you look at the conventional banks? Is it something that's fluid and changes over the t- over time? How do you deal with pricing? Yeah, w- one of the nice things that we did is we standardized our, our, our pricing and our business loan product. And we put the power in the hands of the merchant. So the merchant can go on and design their own loan. You determine the amount. You determine uh, the term. You determine um, the period of time within parameters. And I think that goes a long way to putting the power, empowering uh, the end, you know, end business user. And, and that goes a long way. But certainly we compare, you know, competitors and and. And we and we look at the market situation, but uh, for the most part, you know, I think our sort of policy has been has been a good one. And quickly, so when you refer to yourself, do you ever call yourself a bank? Uh, no, I like to refer to ourselves as a financial technology company because I think you know the the technology aspect is what really excites me. I think this is the user experience, making this really uh, e- much easier, much simpler for for small businesses to get access to working capital is what really drives us and motivates us to make the user experience you know so much better than maybe it is today. Uh, and and that that's that's how I would explain it. David Suede of Velocity Financial Group will have his one piece of advice for today's entrepreneur coming up. Uh, Ernie Furt also joins us from Fuller Lando to talk about tax issues. And uh, that is on the way. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. 7.50 on today's Entrepreneur, inspiring stories from outstanding business people. Dan Delmar and Fuller Landau's Josh Miller with you. And this evening, David Swade is with us from Evelocity Financial Group. And we bring in Ernie Furt, tax partner at Fuller Landau. And uh, that year end is coming it's already. Wow. It's, uh, you know, it's just around like, November. How, how, how many days left till Christmas, Dan? Too, a few. Too few. Uh, too, too few. But when you think about it and you think all the businesses that have their calendar year ends, which is really the, the, the majority of the businesses out there, you really do got to think ahead. And, you know, what are the challenges? What are the, what are the thoughts that entrepreneurs should have before they wind out their year? Uh, at least from a tax perspective to keep, you know, to keep as much many dollars in their pocket as possible. So, uh, so Ernie, uh, what's the first few things that come to mind as, as business owners uh, almost wind down their year? Well, you have to get all your your stuff in order to, to to a great extent, and if you need to purchase some assets that you're contemplating purchasing, and you may want to purchase them either in January or February, maybe you want to accelerate that purchase, and you could potentially claim additional capital cost allowance as long as the asset's available for use. You'll be able to do that if you purchase it before December thirty first, assuming you're you're a year end calendar. In other words, 
buy it a buy it thirty days early and get your depreciation. That's so right. You can pay a, have a, I guess a lower bottom line. You have a lower a, bottom yeah. line, so it ends up saving you a little bit of tax earlier. You're 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 accelerating your purchase, but you're not accelerating it by that much. What about you know certain tax credits that people can take advantage of before the end of the year, whether it's because of of assets they're going to purchase or or certain expenditures that might qualify. You always have to look at the type of credits that uh, that are available to you in businesses. You know, you're not going to necessarily embark on an R and D project that you're going to finish, you know, by the end of the year. But if you're thinking of doing R and D, that's one. Uh, you know, you can do it, and you 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 can you don't have to necessarily finish the project, as long as you're you're starting the project. That's that that's good enough. If you want to buy certain assets, certain manufacturing assets that you're going to acquire before year end, you can get that credit too in Quebec. There, there's lots of stuff on the job, tax training credits. There, you know, you, you just have to look at the list. And there's a list, you know, available at Revenue Quebec. And there's, and you have to make sure that uh, you qualify for all those credits and you can do it within the timing. But, you know, some people have different types of businesses as well. Some people have investment businesses. And investment businesses, this is something that you have to take a look at a little bit more stringently because, you know, this year was an up and down year for, for stocks. So you want to take a look at your portfolio and you want to take a look at your statement and see, see where you sit. You know, do you have capital gains? Do you want to pay a capital dividend account to the shareholders? Is it a possibility? You have to talk to your accountant and, and, and have these discussions. In addition, you may want to sell your losers. For those that aren't sure what a capital dividend account is, capital dividend account is effectively sorry, Josh. That don't is... apologize to me, Ernie. <laughs> I, I got it covered, <laughs> but we don't. You don't. A capital <laughs> dividend account is effectively the non-taxable portion of your capital gain. A capital gain is taxable at fifty percent, so the other fifty percent is non-taxable in a corporation. This is only in a corporation, and you could pay that non-taxable portion tax-free to the shareholder. That's uh, listen. That that's something that that people don't take enough advantage of, and it no. certainly it, it usually happens in real time. So you you really got to take advantage of it as it happens throughout the year. So and when we come back from the break, uh, a little bit more on corporations, maybe a little personal. You never know what uh, what words of wisdom comes out of Ernie's mouth. And also David Swade with his one piece of advice for today's entrepreneur. That's next. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. 756, welcome back to Today's Entrepreneur. Joining us in studio, David Swade of Velocity Financial Group. We'll have some advice for Today's Entrepreneur in just a second. And Ernie Furt, tax partner at Fuller Landau. And uh, yeah, it is November. That, that year end is right around the corner. Right around the corner. And, you know, we, we're talking about, you know, things to think about from a corporate standpoint, planning for the year end. But there's some stuff you do corporately that also affects personally. So you, you, you can't ignore both. I mean, you know, same pair of pants, lots of different pockets, uh, but there's certainly areas that affect both sides, corporate and personal. Uh, Ernie, maybe you can elaborate a little. Because we have an integrated tax system and, you know, you take a look and you, you, you can pay yourself a salary or decide to pay a dividend, whatever works best for your financial situation and your corporate financial situation, as well as your personal one. You know, if you if you're very big on taking RRSPs and you haven't taken a salary during the year, maybe you should consider taking a salary so next year you can do an RRSP. If you really don't care about RRSPs, maybe a dividend is a good option. Take your dividend, and then you can put some money in a, a tax-free savings account. You know, currently the limit in the tax-free savings account is, is ten grand. Uh, that may change, so maybe you should do that this year, and you should do it before there is a change. There's a lot of people, you know, there, there's certainly a lot of rules about reporting your foreign income, um, and some people are a little afraid of it. If they get rid of their foreign stuff now, are they off the hook or they still have to report? Unfortunately, they're not off the hook uh, because you're going to have to report gains and losses and income with respect to those foreign assets, so they're still going to be there. But you have to look at your foreign assets, and most brokers today, if you're dealing with a Canadian broker, will provide you statements to help you uh, prepare that foreign income verification statement and of course when you're planning for your end you know uh, i hear a lot you know okay I, I can't spend it before your end i'm going to spend it after your end it kind of relates to my year end uh what things should entrepreneurs kind of be aware of from that standpoint well you can accrue expenses but they had you know you don't have to pay it necessarily you would inc you incur the expense but you you accrue it uh, and you'll pay you'll pay it later 
Uh, you can also finance the expense. You get a loan. That's one way of doing it and incur that expense in order to get that deduction and accelerate, uh, accelerate the deduction so you don't have to pay a lot of tax at the end of the year. Loans, loans between ten and two hundred thousand that can be applied for online. Oh my no. gosh! <laughs> no, 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 it's all good. Is there any quick things that that you do, David, just before year end? Uh, any quick planning? Uh, something you can throw out there? I mean, a lot of things that uh, Ernie's taught, been talking about. Just, just making sure you're planning. You know, things like CDAs and bonus bonus options and different you know strategies to to make sure you take advantage of all the options at your fingertips. Excellent. So as we approach our, our last moment of the show, uh, as we do every week, we'll turn to you, David, and, and ask you, what would be your one piece of advice for today's entrepreneur? I think uh, I'll ch- uh, one. Um, I'm going to give a couple. First is I think uh, do your best to make sure you're well capitalized and well financed uh, for growth. Two, uh, make sure you bring in really, really strong people and put a structure around them uh, to help so as you grow, they grow with it. And thirdly, uh, for them and for the company, always set goals. Always me- measure and monitor your goals. Set the goal, monitor how are we doing compared to, to to plan and target. And I think what that does for both the employees and the company is is keeps everybody focused in the same direction, rowing in the same direction, understanding what they're doing matters, matters to the company and to themselves personally. And I think when people feel they're part of something and something big, um, they'll give you their 110%. So those those are my three thoughts, maybe not one. <laughs> No, it's perfect. They're 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 all very valid. And and Dan, my my quick takeaway is certainly and and it was a little subtle at the beginning, but there was this business e velocity kind of came about from another business and another experience that that David lived with some partners. And, and I think there there's always something to be said of gaining insight from something you're already doing. And I think that was that was a a, a great start to the story of e velocity. And people just got to know that you can have a success, but from there, other successes can be bred. Thanks very much, uh, David. Ooh. Thanks very much, David Swade of Velocity Financial Group and Ernie Furt, partner at Fuller Landau. Uh, Josh, we're back next week. Uh, Mike Newton will actually be filling in for you next week. Yes, sir. Uh, here Monday nights at 7 p.m. for today's Entrepreneur. The Exchange is next.